What does a late 6th century battle in what is now the country of Northern Ireland have to do with the history of copyright? Keep watching to find out. a librarian at the University of Montana's Mansfield Library. And welcome to the second video for the second unit of Who Owns Culture? An Introduction to Copyright. This is the second of three videos on Unit 2, The History of Copyright. In this video, we are going to explore how technological and historical developments from early medieval Europe to early 18th century England influenced the United States copyright as we know it today. By the end of this unit, you will be comfortable explaining two things to someone who knows nothing about copyright. One, how society's definition and view of an author or creator has changed over history. And two, three to four major historical events that contributed to the development of copyright as we know it today. So, Let's pick up where we left off at the chronological end of the Roman Empire and head to early medieval Ireland. We'll be examining one of the first recorded disputes related to what we now distinguish as copyright. A fair warning here, some of the details of the following disputes are likely more legend than actual fact due to lack of contemporary documentation. However, the basic outline of the dispute is still important to the development of copyright. Mid-6th century Ireland was a land in transition. Several ruling families vied for power and Christianity was becoming a major influence on religion in the country. Controlling the spread of information was of great importance to those in power. Religious zealots burned Christian texts and, as a result, there was a shortage of books. One monk, St. Columba, wished to preserve these texts. He and other monks would copy such texts by hand and distribute them widely in Ireland. These practices likely saved a significant chunk of Christian literature from being destroyed in this time period. St. Columba's teacher, St. Finian, possessed a rare copy of the Latin Vulgate. Remember that from the last video? Some also say that it was a rare copy of a Psalter. Anyway, Finian was very protective of his rare copy of the Vulgate. Columba wanted badly to reproduce it so that more copies could be distributed in Ireland. Finian refused, so Columba copied the Vulgate in secret. Finian eventually discovered that Columba was copying his Vulgate in secret and was quite angry. He wanted the copy that Columba created. St. Columba thought it was foolhardy of St. Finian to not want his Vulgate copied. More copies meant that the Vulgate would be preserved and would further spread Christianity in Ireland. The two monks went before King Dermot to settle the matter. Both sides argued their case and King Dermot rendered his judgment in favor of Finian by famously saying, quote, to every cow her calf, to each book its copy. Columba was ordered to give Finian the copy of the Vulgate that he secretly created. Legend has it, though, that Columba refused to do so. Needless to say, there was still bad blood between Columba and King Dermot's decision in favor of Finian. Not too long after the decision was made, Columba was given the opportunity to harbor a captive of King Dermot. He did so as he was a priest, and the church offered sanctuary to such captives. King Dermot's men were ordered to find the captive. They went one step further by violating these sanctuary rules and killed the captive right in the church. In response, Columba called his powerful family, the O'Neill clan, to battle against King Dermot. The Battle of Kuldrevne, or the Battle of the Book, took place and 3,000 people were killed as a result. 
the church was going to excommunicate Columba, but instead he voluntarily exiled himself to the Scottish island of Iona as a penance. Elsewhere in medieval Europe, authors often took on a number of roles that were not totally limited to the written word. They could be singers, troubadours, jugglers, performers of poetry and stories, instrumentalists, academics, or members of the clergy. In the 7th century, popular poets would publicly perform by improvising on poems written by classical authors such as Homer or Virgil. They believed that creativity results from borrowing and imitation. Many early medieval authors preferred to go by the pen name Anon or Anonymous. Doing so allowed them to more freely borrow material from others and to be frank about the society in which they lived. Religious beliefs of the time were another strong influence on how early medieval society perceived the concept of authorship. They believed that the true source and owner of all creativity was God. Such beliefs date back to classical times and contribute to a sense of communal authorship, even though individual authors commanded their own respect. St. Bonaventure, who was born in 1221 and died in 1274, described four ways of making a book. I quote from Elizabeth L. Eisenstein from her book, The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, from pages 121 through 122. A man might write the work of works of others, adding and changing nothing, in which case he is simply called a scribe. Another writes the work of others with additions which are not his own, and he is called a compiler. Another writes both others' work and his own, but with others' work in principal place, adding his own for purposes of explanation, and he is called a commentator. Another writes both his own work and others, but with his own work in principal place, adding others for purposes of confirmation. And such men should be called an author. St. Bonaventure's concept of an author was not someone who entirely created his own original work. Such work was still collaborative. He also considered all four ways of making a book to be equal. Despite medieval authors' liberty to borrow material without being accused of stealing, and their ability to remain anonymous, they were not completely free to say whatever they wanted. This was especially true of Catholic clergy members. One example features Peter Abelard in the mid-12th century. His writing, Theology, contained interpretations of Christian dogma with which, which the church disagreed. As a result, he was condemned by the Pope. Such censorship also pertained to faculty and students of medieval universities. In the early 13th century, Catholic leadership forbade faculty at the University of Paris from teaching or using the books of Aristotle in its classes. The penalty for doing so was excommunication. In the 1230s, Pope Gregory IX exerted further control over the teaching of Aristotle by convening a group of censors to review books and to eliminate any content that conflicted with Christian doctrines. In spite of such bans, in the 14th century, the Italian Renaissance begins, and the concepts of humanism, or the philosophies and teachings of ancient Greece and Rome, start to have a pervasive influence on Western European culture. Up to this point, poets stood out by virtue of their skill at writing. They did not necessarily reflect upon being individual authors or upon their individual reputations. The Italian poet Petrarch indicates a shift in this paradigm with his letter to posterity. In it, he gives the reader a brief autobiography and focuses on his work and his reputation as an author. Here, we see the beginnings of how current society views modern authors. Books in this time period were created and distributed according to procedures that were much more dynamic and complex than one might think for the time. 
A prevalent way to uh, publish a book was uh, for an author to read their manuscript aloud to scribes or to others who wanted to listen to the author. It is likely that a reading such as this, or a pronunciation, would be publicly advertised so that the author had an audience to record their words into copies that could then be sold or at least further distributed. The author could still add material or make corrections to their texts by finding previous copies and altering them or by having others do it through correspondence. The work could be further copied and distributed by anyone who owned a copy. One could hire a copyist to do it or they could do it themselves. Readers could add their own annotations or make other changes to their copy of the book. Such altered books could be copied again with no acknowledgement of such changes. In terms of how these authors made a living, most writers, especially those who authored secular texts, had patrons. For instance, the French author Christine de Pizan would produce a number of beautifully elaborate copies of her works for her patrons. These patrons would pay her for the creation of such copies, but were not responsible for selling further copies of her works and then paying her royalties. Writers of religious or academic texts relied more on their positions or offices to earn money for their writing. The ability for such authors to fund their work also depended upon their reputation. For instance, the influential scholar and theologian Jean Gerson held official titles within the academy as well as the church. His works therefore enjoyed a wide readership without the need for patrons. In terms of the creation of books, it was fairly simple to copy a text by hand and keep distributing or selling copies of it. However, such tasks were not necessarily easy. It's important to note that the creation of books took a fair amount of time and resources to produce. For starters, an author needed parchment, ink, writing implements, and bookbinding supplies. Authors or copyists might also employ scribes, artists, or illuminators, as well as bookbinders. Because of the resource-heavy nature of book creation in medieval Europe, information was easier to control by those in power. Earlier, I talked about Peter Abelin being condemned by the Catholic Church for circulating ideas with which it disagreed. Earlier in the medieval period, people could be excommunicated for such transgressions. In the late medieval period, however, people were executed for spreading such information. Take the Czech theologian Jan Hus for an instance. During the late 1300s and early 1400s, the Catholic Church was engulfed by the Western Schism when at least three individuals laid claim to the papacy. Remember John Wycliffe, who translated the Latin Vulgate into English in the late 1300s? Along with others in what we now know as the Czech Republic, Hus was inspired by Wycliffe's teachings that advocated for changes in how the Catholic Church was run. Wycliffe was declared a heretic in England, but his ideas nonetheless spread to others in that country as well as into the Czech Republic. In 1411, Hus was excommunicated by the Pope for his belief that the Church should be reformed. The following year, he wrote a book outlining his beliefs called De Ecclesia. In 1414, Hus was arrested and burned at the stake for heresy. In the mid-1400s, it became easier to spread information through the revolutionary invention of the printing press. Johannes Gutenberg printed copies of the Bible with his newly invented press around 1440. Not long after, his press was imitated and soon books and literature of all kinds spread much more quickly throughout Europe. Literacy rates in Europe at the time of the printing press invention, or around 1450 to 1500, were beginning to increase. In rural areas, it was 5% of the population. In cities, it was 20 to 30% of the population. By 1500, there were about 1,000 printing presses in Western Europe, and nearly 13 million volumes were printed from 1450 to 
1500. Production of individual book titles by the end of the 15th century was about 260,000 per year. By comparison, the production of individual book titles in the 6th century CE was only about 120 per year. Moving further along into the 1500s, the Protestant Reformation likely owes its, its existence in large part to the invention of the printing press. Although individuals were still being excommunicated, condemned, or sentenced to death for confronting the Catholic Church during this time, their ideas were not as easily quashed since they were more widely distributed in print. Martin Luther is probably the best example of how the printing press influenced the Reformation. One of his most famous writings is the 95 Theses, which criticized the Catholic Church for its abuses, namely those of indulgences, where worshippers could purchase an, insur an assurance that their sins would be absolved. The Theses were famously nailed to the door of a cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany, and were subsequently printed and very widely distributed. In the 1520s, Luther translated the Bible into German from Hebrew and Greek and had it printed. At the time, Catholic Church leadership was opposed to translations of the Bible in vernacular languages, or any language other than Latin in this example. They believed that lay people would create too many different interpretations of it, which would result in conflict. Although Martin Luther's writings were banned in some parts of Germany, as well as abroad, his ideas were too widely distributed for such censorship to be effective. The Catholic Church then distributed an authorized German translation, to which Martin Luther reacted by accusing the Church of stealing his work. Despite the conflicts between Martin Luther and the Church, other new Protestant sects of Christianity rose up and took advantage of the new printing technology to spread their message. This included Calvinists, as well as the creation of the Church of England in 1533. They used the printing press not only to print religious texts, but also to ridicule the Catholic Church's abuses and excesses in the 1520s and 1530s. Even though texts were easily disseminated on account of the printing press, European leaders began to control what was printed by issuing government licenses to certain printers. The printers could then act as censors for the government through following the terms of their respective licenses. Some governments were more laissez-faire than others with respect to such privileges, since they were more interested in the economic aspects of printing. Take 15th to early 16th century Venice as an example. The first recorded instance of such printing privileges takes place in 1469. A German immigrant named Johannes of Speyer received a five-year monopoly on printing for all of Venice. However, he did not live to enjoy it much as he passed away later that same year. There were plenty of other printers clamoring for such licenses in Venice which helped that city become a major center of publishing during these times. Conflicts over such rights to print definitely came up with respect to these licenses. Here are a couple of famous ones. A very early case is Scotto versus Benaglio, which took place in Venice in 1503. Bernardino Benaglio illegally printed an Arabic medical tract for which Amadeo Scotto had a privilege. Scotto sued through a Venetian government body that tried civil crimes, and Benaglio had to stop printing the tract. Another example involves the German artist and printmaker Albrecht Dürer and the Italian artist and printmaker Marc Antonio Raimondi. Dürer created a series of woodblock prints entitled Life of the Virgin in the first decade of the 16th century. These prints were sold all over Europe and were very well known. Raimondi took some of Dürer's prints, created nearly perfect woodblock copies, and proceeded to have them published and sold. On the left is one of Dürer's original images from the Life of the Virgin series, entitled Joachim and Anne Meeting at the Golden Gate. 
The other is by Raimondi. According to 1550 Artist Biographical Dictionary, Dürer took legal action against Raimondi to get him to stop printing and selling his copies. As a result, Raimondi had to stop using Dürer's signature in the copies he sold, but he was still allowed to sell the copies. Nevertheless, Dürer continued to print his series. Dürer states the following in a 1511 edition. Woe to you, ambusher of other people's labor and talent. Beware of laying your rash hand on our work. Know you not what the most glorious Roman emperor Maximilian has conceded to us? That no one shall be allowed to reprint these pictures from spurious blocks, nor sell them within the imperial realm. And if you do so through spite or covetousness, not only will your goods be confiscated, but you will also find yourself in the greatest danger. Now, we'll be turning our attention to England, providing a foundation for the evolution of copyright in the United States. In 1476, William Caxton is thought to have brought the first printing press to England. That same year, he printed a copy of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. He had considerable influence at the English court, and probably because of this, no one ever made unauthorized copies of his publications. At this time, printers were the ones who mainly benefited from selling copies of works. Authors did not have a right to the content in their works in the same way that we think of now. At first, the English government thought of the printing press as a means to create new trade. From the 1480s through the 1530s, England encouraged foreign printers and booksellers to offer their services and wares for sale. This created tension with English printers and booksellers. After rioting broke out in the late 1520s, legislation came about that severely restricted importation of books into England, as well as foreign booksellers and printers' businesses. Although such legislation was passed for economic reasons, it also meshed well with some censorship efforts on behalf of Henry VIII, especially after he famously formed the Church of England so he could divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn. This is where the Worshipful Company of Stationers, or the Stationers Company, appears in the history of copyright. Formed in 1403, the Stationers Company was a guild of printers, bookbinders, and booksellers. The Stationers Company wished to gain a monopoly over publishing in Tudor England. They attempted to do so in 1542 by requesting a license from Henry VIII to print all books in England. He refused. The Stationers continued to petition the king for the next 30 years until his death in 1547. Henry VIII's son, Edward VI, never reached the age of majority as a king since he died at age 15 in 1553. After his death, Mary I began her reign and she decided to bring Catholicism back to England and persecuted Protestants. Protestant? Catholic? It didn't matter to the stationer's company. Mary I found their argument for a printing monopoly as a way to carry out censorship of undesirable books attractive. In 1557, the Stationers' Company finally got their wish. Mary I created the Royal Charter of the Company of Stationers, which allowed them to do the following. 1. They were the only group allowed to print material in any part of England. 2. Anyone wishing to print anything needed to be a member of the stationers, and they also needed to go through an approval and registration process. This was the main mechanism by which seditious or heretical material was censored. Three, any of the stationers who successfully registered a publication had an indefinite monopoly of rights to print, sell, and distribute that publication. In essence, they had a permanent copyright. Government support for the stationers' monopoly waxed and waned as the country entered into civil wars from 1643 to 1651. 
the stationers would support whoever was winning at the time, either the king or parliament. By the end of the civil wars, the British parliament had grown weary of the monopoly given to the stationers. Specifically, they were tired of the abuses of power and sweeping decrees by the monarchy and the stationers' role in such abuses. Therefore, Parliament declined to renew the license for the stationers in 1695. The stationers continued to exist, but finally had competitors after a long monopoly on printing and publishing. In 1710, the era of constitutional monarchy in Britain was well underway. Fifteen years after ending the stationers' monopoly in 1695, Parliament passed the first copyright law called the Statute of Anne. Authors, rather than printers or booksellers, now own the copyright in their works for the very first time. The Statute of Anne gave the following protections to authors of books. One, for books that were not yet published at the time that the law was passed, the duration of protection was 14 years plus one renewal term of 14 years. Two, for books that had already been published prior to the law passing, the duration of protection was 21 years with no renewals. The stationer's company, publishers, and other booksellers no longer had perpetual copyright on books and other literature. They appealed to the government and to the courts to regain their everlasting monopoly after the Statute of Anne was passed. Their main argument was that booksellers and printers would be forced to close shop due to the new law. Despite such protests, publishers and booksellers were ultimately unsuccessful in their efforts to get the law overturned. So, in the next video, we'll be wrapping up the unit by discussing copyright in colonial America through the present. Thanks for watching.